Greetings everyone, my name is Reynolds and today we are talking about Imperial Assassins, the good, the bad and how you could use them in your games of Warhammer 40,000. This video was suggested by some viewers over on the Discord. If you're not already a part of that, you can just click the link in the description and it'll take you there. Absolutely free and it's a good place to just discuss Warhammer, Custodes, all that good stuff. So yeah, feel free to hit that link in the description below. So, the Imperial Assassins. They've been quite good, all of them, in 10th edition, some more than others, and after a bit of playing, it's quite clear that there are specifically two that are quite good, one that is eh, and one that's pretty bad. First and foremost, what are Imperial Assassins? They are a faction that is under other Imperium factions called Agents of the Imperium. This also includes Inquisitors, the Arbides, Navy Breachers, and whatever else you have. Basically, every Imperium unit that exists in the game, but doesn't have its own faction. Now, the way this works for most of you who are playing 2000 point games is that in your army, you are allowed to take two character units as well as two retinue units from the Agents of the Imperium. Granted, you are playing an Imperium army. For the Assassins, they come in four different variations. We will talk more about each of them individually in just a moment. But in theory, you could take the Sniper Assassin, as well as one of the Melee Assassins in your army, and then also include two units of retinue, such as Navy Breachers or Arbides or Inquisitorial Henchmen. But you wouldn't be able to take, say, two Assassins and two Inquisitors. It has to be two characters total, or of course just one character, but you cannot go above that limit, no matter if it's Inquisitors, Assassins, or a mix of both. Now, why are the Assassins generally used in Custodes specifically? Well, first of all, it's the fact that we don't have a lot of units that can perform those tasks, such as just holding an objective or do secondary actions. If we're doing that with our big Custodes units, we're usually wasting a lot of points. And so it's very nice to have those smaller, less expensive units that can do it for us. Now, we do have those units in the form of Sisters of Silence. These girls are cheap and they do their job just perfectly. But there is one thing they don't have, and that is survivability. One great way to get survivability, as we have learned in 10th edition, is getting the lone operative keyword. That keyword makes it so no one can target your model or unit if they are outside of 12 inches, which basically means they need to go into melee range. And if they're going into melee range, well, then we usually have a good counterpunch with some custodian guards, wardens, terminators, etc. So that's kind of the role that those uh, assassins are filling for the custodies. They can go out, do actions, hold objectives without immediately being taken down by, say, indirect fire, which is quite popular, or just, you know, get an angle from somewhere down the board and then shut away. So that is what the Imperial Assassins do for custodies and why you generally include them in your army. Let's start off by talking about the Vindicar Assassin, also known as the Assassin, putting the ass in Assassin because this model has a big fat booty and that's why. So first of all, the sniper dude, what is he? Well, he is 80 points for a one model and you can only include one of them per army list, by the way. So you cannot do double uh, Vindicar assassin. You can take two assassins, an Evasaur and a Vindicar, but not double on any of one of them. He moves seven inches. He has four wounds and a four up invulnerable save. He also has stealth, lone operative, and he also has infiltrate. I seem to have forgotten to add that to the list here. His weapons are twofold. He has a sniper pistol and, well, he has a sniper and a pistol, not a sniper pistol. He also has a melee weapon, but let's be real, if you're in melee with this guy, things have gone way wrong. So first of all, the sniper, it is 48 inch range, one shot, ballistic skill 2, strength 7, AP 3, and damage D3 plus 3. The weapon itself has devastating wounds, ignore cover, and precision. His pistol is 12 inches, 3 shots, ballistic skill 2, strength 5, AP 2, and damage 3. It also has devastating wounds, ignore cover and precision, but of course it is also a pistol, so you could use it in melee. His abilities, outside of lone operative, stealth and infiltrate, is dead shot, which means that on a critical hit roll, this is important, hit roll, not wound roll, you add 3 to the damage characteristic of whatever weapon you're shooting, whether that be the sniper or the pistol. So, if you rolled a 6 to hit, the damage of your sniper would go from D3 plus 3 to D3 plus 6. The pistol would go from damage 3 to damage 6. In addition, whatever target you shot with this guy must then also take a battle shock test after the attacks have been resolved. 
His second ability is a once per game ability called the Shield Breaker Round. And when you use the Shield Breaker Round, you have to do it before you actually roll the dice. But for that one shot, your opponent cannot make a saving throw or an invulnerable saving throw. So that means that if you hit and you wound, you go straight to damage. It basically guarantees that one shot, if it wounds, is devastating wounds. So that is the Vindicar Assassin. On paper, he looks very cool at shooting characters out of units, but he has quite a lot of flaws, so let's talk about those. So, I have several issues with the Vindicar Assassin. First and foremost, he is extremely terrain dependent. If you're playing on terrain with multiple floors and you can put him in a spot where he cannot be shot at directly, or rather, not directly, but be shot at by turn one, that is very nice, because if you can put him up high, that means he's basically unchargeable, and if your opponent cannot get within 12 inches of him turn 1 or maybe even by turn 2, that also means he's fairly safe from shooting. From up high, he should have a better vantage point, being able to get more line of sight around the map, and therefore be able to use his gun more efficiently. However, if you're playing competitive Warhammer, which I think most of you watching this channel is, or at least, you know, semi-competitive, you will also know that terrain rarely has that many floors in 10th edition, that's kind of just like the normal play of Warhammer 40k. If a building has a level you can like stand on top of the roof, it's usually not more than 5 inches above the ground. An engagement range, if you weren't aware, is within 1 inch horizontally, but 5 inches vertically. So even if you're not in base-to-base -base contact with the guy on top of the roof, if you are within 5 inches of him vertically by standing at the bottom floor, you can still fight him. So as such, usually the terrain is against him. Speaking of terrain, let's talk about the precision rule. I assume most of you, because you are smart people and you're watching my channel and therefore you know these things, but if you weren't aware, precision only works if your model or your unit have actual line of sight on the character. So as an example, if your character is behind a wall, but the five models he's joining is outside of the wall, even if you can see all five of those models, because you cannot see the character, you cannot use your precision rule to allocate a wound on the character. That is just how that works. The next part is that he is super swingy in damage. D3 plus 3 damage sounds really good, but let's just go back and look at the facts. It is one shot. One shot. There's no room for mistakes in dice rolling here. He is hitting on a 2+, plus, which means, more than likely, he is hitting. He is strength 7, which means that in most cases, he will wound an infantry character on a 3+. Once again, good chances, but it is not impossible to roll a 1 or a 2. EP3 is nice, nothing to say there. Damage D3 plus 3 means that at a minimum, he'll deal 4 damage. Now, if you're using this guy to target your regular Space Marine character, that usually works out in your favor, because they are, most of the time, 4 wounds. However, there's also Gravis characters, there's also Terminators, and like, I'm not spe speaking just about Space Marines, but general characters in, you know, different variations and different armies. As soon as you hit those guys, the damage becomes a little bit swingy. The way to get around that is, of course, to roll a 6 on the hit roll. Unfortunately, there are no rerolls available to this guy outside of command point rerolling. And the fact that you not only need a 6 to get those devastating wounds for your normal shots, but you need a 6 to hit to get that bonus damage. So you have a 1 in 6 chance on the hit roll to get the bonus damage, and then you have a 1 in 6 chance on the wound roll to get the devastating wounds, to go straight through any invulnerable saves or anything else they may have. Now once per game, you can basically shoot one bullet that says this counts as being devastating wounds because I ignore armor save and invulnerable saves, no matter what. But it does not get around feel no pains, and if you are targeting a character with say 5 plus wounds, they usually have an ability that's like, if this unit is joined by blah blah blah, they have a 5 up feel no pain or a 4 up feel no pain, or the character itself has a built in 5 up feel no pain, like Trajan. And then there's also the fact that it doesn't get around minus 1 damage or half damage, or if the character has, you know, on a 2 plus they can stand back up. And once you start realizing all of those ways to kind of avoid the power of this guy, the points just aren't well spent. You would rather spend those 80 points on just making a normal unit even better. Say, like, 
putting a blade champion in a custodian guard squad, right? I know 80 points is not enough to actually get the blade champion, but then you can find those 40 points somewhere else most likely. In general, I think the Vindicare Assassin is actually the strongest assassin if you're an absolute casual gamer, which by the way, there's nothing wrong with being a casual Warhammer player. But coming from a competitive standpoint, I just don't see him doing a lot in the current metagame. When I think about the terrain boards and how I would position him, he's, he's too easy to avoid. He can't really, you know, he can't advance and shoot. He's not that fast, so if something gets in range of him, he's probably done for. And in general, I just see too many downsides to bringing him compared to spending those 80 points on, you know, just basically anything else. All right, moving on, we have the Coloxus, the Coloxus, the, the whatever assassin, I don't know his name. I call him the meth head because he looks like he's just having a jolly old good time, but boy does he fuck shit up wherever he goes. This guy is for you when you really hate Psykers, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. First and foremost, he is 85 points for the model. He gets 7 inch movement, 4 wounds, 4 plus plus, which means invulnerable save by the way, stealth, and a 2 up feel no pain versus psychic weapons. If you haven't already caught on, every single assassin has 4 wounds with a 4 up invulnerable save. They have like a 6 up armor save. So there's no differentiating between their toughness. They're all toughness 4 with a 4 up invulnerable save and 4 wounds. That's it. Right, for his weapons, he has a ranged weapon, which is 24 inches, 3 shots, hitting on 2s, strength 5, AP 2, and damage D3, with the anti psyker 2 plus, assault keyword, precision keyword, and the psychic assassin keyword, which is actually exclusive to this model as far as I'm aware. In melee, he gets 4 attacks, hitting on 2s, strength 4, AP 2, and damage 2. Once again, anti psyker precision, but also devastating wounds. For his abilities outside of stealth, oh and lone operative, they all have lone operative by the way, he has the psychic assassin ability, which means that any weapon with this keyword gets an attack characteristic of 6 when used against psykers. The keen eye may have already spotted that that means his gun goes to 6 shots against psykers. That's it. Then he also has the Soulless Horror ability, which reduces the leadership by 1 or by 2 if it's a Psyker when he's within 6 inches of a unit. And then once per battle, all enemy units within 6 inches must take a Battleshock test, and he can decide to use his ability in any command phase. Alright, so on paper, it's pretty clear what this guy does. He wants to fuck some Psykers up. Unfortunately, we are currently in the game not seeing that many Psykers. And when we are... I'm kind of doubtful this guy can actually get to them. He basically only does one job, and that is killing psychic units. So if you really hate playing against Grey Knights and Thousand Sons and play against them often, then he's okay, but he's still not great. That's because he's still fairly slow. He doesn't get to scout move, he doesn't get to infiltrate, he doesn't get to advance, charge or shoot, and he moves 7 inches. His once per game battle shock means you have to be within 6 inches of something. And let me tell you, if you put a toughness 4, 4 wound model with a 4 up invulnerable save, and that's it, anywhere near enemies, such as within 6 inches, chances are he's dead right after using the ability. The best case scenario for this is that you charge a psychic unit. That psychic unit does not have flamers. So like half the Thousand Suns army is already out because they basically all have flamers. You charge that unit, you kill that unit, and then in your opponent's command phase, you use your battle shock test, they fail it on everything that's on an objective, and they don't score primary, and then this guy dies. That is the best case scenario. However, I'm trying to think of how many times that would have happened in any game if I had brought him, and the answer is basically zero. And yes, you look at this and be like, oh, he's precision and uh, anti psyker and blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah, that's great. But again, you need to target psychic units. There aren't that many psychic units. Oh, but like everyone brings one psyker and like tyranids and blah 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 blah. But if you tell them that you have an anti psyker 2 plus model that's gonna run for their for the fucking hills after that one psyker unit, your opponent's probably gonna screen them. They're gonna put a chaff unit in front of them, they're gonna put them in a place where if you do charge them, I can overwatch you. And then they maybe have a flamer, or they just get lucky. Whatever it is. The Coloxus Assassin does one thing and one thing only, and it's running in and trying to beat something up. And I just don't see him doing that very well in any competitive setting at all. The third assassin is the Eversore Assassin. And this guy is a bit of, can do a little bit of everything assassin. He is fast as fuck boy. Coming in at 75 points, he gets 9 inches of movement, 
four wounds, four up invulnerable save, but then also gets Scout 9 inches. His weapons are a 12 inch range pistol with four shots, business skill 2, strength 4, AP 0, and damage 1, but it does have the anti infantry 3. In melee, he gets six attacks, hitting on twos, strength 5, AP 2, damage 2, and anti infantry 3. His abilities are Friends On. In your command phase, you can choose either Precision for all of his weapons, Advanced Shoot and Charge, or Sustain Hits 3 for all of his weapons. His second ability is Sentinel Array, and that gives him a free Overwatch. So, I think the Eversor Assassin are among the good assassins. That is because, as I just mentioned, he can do a little bit of everything, which makes him very versatile. Because he gets to Scout Move, then Normal Move, then potentially Advance and Charge, if you chose the Advanced Shoot and Charge ability in the command phase, he has an average threat range of 28 inches turn 1. Now, if you are yeeting him across the board like that, turn 1, he's most likely also dead. But that is an option you have. If you really want to go kick that solitaire in his face, turn 1, that is an option. He has good infantry killing power because he has anti-infantry on both his pistol as well as his melee weapon. His pistol is not going to kill that many space marines, but he is going to damage a few of them. And in melee, he's damaged two, so that's going to pick up a few of them. Then, if you add in the fact that he can get sustained hits three on all of his attacks, that means you're looking at an average of eight hits in melee. Sorry, an average of nine hits in melee because he's hitting on twos. No, wait, eight is right. You miss one, you get three back. Yep, eight, eight average hits in melee. At AP two, damage two, anti-infantry two plus, three plus, so that is going to pick up quite a few infantry models, basically against anything. Normal Marines, Terminators, Custodes, that's going to kill anywhere between 3 and 4 Normal Marines, and then 1 or 2 Terminators slash Custodes. And that is good value for 75 points. Speaking of which, 75 points makes him the cheapest Assassin available. And as we just discussed, he can do a little bit of everything. He can move around the board fast and get into combat. He can also just scout move to get on an objective or do a secondary action. He can clear out chaff. All of this for 75 points while also having lone operative. The overwatch ability is niche because if you are using the overwatch, you're shooting four shots with his pistol. Now, if you already have the sustain hits three ability active, I mean, at least if you get one hit, you actually get four hits because you roll a six to hit and that generates three additional hits. So four hits for just one dice. But it's still a pistol at strength 4, AP 0, damage 1. Yes, you get anti-infantry 3+, plus, but like, it's not going to do a whole lot in Overwatch. You can use it if, like, say a character is falling back and you want to try and, and, and plink that character off before he goes and does something else. But the Eversaur Assassin is really good. He is the second best assassin, which obviously means that the best assassin is the one we haven't talked about yet, the Kalidus Assassin. The Kalidus Assassin, much like the Eversor Assassin, is very versatile, but probably even better. First and foremost, she is 90 points, which makes her the most expensive assassin. She gets 7 inches of movement, 4 wounds, 4 up invulnerable save, infiltrate, and fight first. Her weapons are a 12 inch range flamer, d6 shots, I wrote in ability skill 2, but it doesn't matter, it's a flamer, strength 5, AP 2, and damage 1. It has anti-infantry 2 plus, and precision. That basically means you don't worry about strength 5, because most likely you will be shooting infantry with her, and if you're doing that, you're just wounding on 2s. Now it is only damage 1, but it's AP 2, so if you get a little bit lucky, it's a very strong overwatch weapon. Her melee is quite decent as well, because she has fight first, if you charge her, she gets to punch you first with 5 attacks hitting on 2s, strength 5, AP 4, and damage 2, which also has lethal hits and precision. She doesn't get the anti-infantry 2 plus keyword here, which, you know, is unfortunate, but she does have lethal hits, which means she can, in theory, punch against anything. On top of that, you have precision. So if you're being charged by a unit that has a leader, and you really just want to make sure you pick off that leader, because maybe you can't kill the full squad anyway, you can decide to allocate those wounds to the leader first, and then take it from there. AP 4 and damage 2 means that she has a decent chance of killing a few models. Her abilities are Polymorphine, and that is like the Alaris ability, but you get to do it every single battle round. The Alaris is once per game. For the Kalidus Assassin, you can do that as many times as you want. So at the end of your opponent's turn, 
you can pick her up and then in your reinforcement step you can put her back down nine inches away from everything. I think I need to clarify because this is one of the comments I get asked the most. Why is it that the Alaris as well as the Calidus can do this turn one? That has to do with the wording of the ability. If you have a unit that says you can pick them up and put them into strategic reserves, you are unable to put them in turn one because strategic reserves does not allow for it turn one. The same goes for normal deep strike. However, the Alaris as well as the Calidus, the wording on their ability does not say they go into strategic reserves. It simply says that you pick them up and you put them back down in your reinforcement steps. That is why you can do it turn one. All right, and then her last ability is Reign of Confusion, which will increase the cost of one of your opponent's battle tactic stratagems by one command point after they use it for the first time. And that is the rest of the game, even if she dies. If you've played any kind of competitive Warhammer against an Imperium faction, chances are if you played against the Kalidus Assassin because she just does it all. I actually, while I was writing this video, was like, is this maybe the highest scoring single unit or single model in the game? Now, I think maybe Biovores take that because they can just shoot spore mines and score secondary points. But for Imperium armies, I think she is up there, if not at the top. She is very mobile, despite not having assault or advanced shoot and charge, because you can pick her up every single battle round. She can really get around the map and be where you want her to be. You still have to be 9 inches away from everything, but you want to do that anyway because you obviously don't want people to shoot at her. But if you need her to do a secondary objective somewhere, she can do that. You need her to go grab the home objective because you just got shut off the home objective with something, she can do that. You need her to try and flame a character to score assassinate, she can do that. She can attempt a 9 inch charge, which of course is always risky, but she has some decent melee. And yeah, that mobility just allows for a ton of play. As we just mentioned earlier, she is decent at killing. The Flamer will not clear a full deep striking unit unless you roll really well and your opponent rolls poorly, but it can put some decent damage into it. If that deep striking unit then charges her, because you know, maybe she's holding your home objective, and they want to steal it from you, well, if they charge her, you get to fight first, and she can do some decent damage there as well. So the Flamer in Overwatch, combined with your fight first, means she has a decent chance of clearing up you know, say a five-man unit of the new Assault Pack Intercessors. Her ability to increase a battle tactic by one command point is a huge help against so many armies. Space Marines, Armor of Contempt, that'll be two CP, sir. Profane Seal for Chaos Space Marines for full hit and wound rerolls, that'll be two CP. Arda's Nails for Orcs to grant them minus one to wound, two CP, thank you, good sir. She does a lot of work against those armies simply because she doesn't allow you to spam that stratagem as much as you would like. There is one thing to note, and that is the Kallus Assassin is still fairly expensive compared to other chaff units. She is a simple but very effective model. At 90 points, however, you do need to make room for her in the list. It's not just like, oh, I have 90 points left over. That doesn't really happen too often. So you do need to think about her being in the list from the start and not add her as an afterthought. But even at those 90 points, she just does so many things that so many armies need help doing. And for custodies, you could argue, oh, I could get two prosecutor squads. Your prosecutor squads are not going to survive as easily. They're not going to be as mobile. And they sure as hell does not have any kind of damage output compared to the Kalidus Assassin. Alright, quickly, before we jump into Tabletop Simulator to give some examples on how to use the Eversaur Assassin and the Kalidus Assassin, let's talk about the Assassin tier list real quick. First up, in Amazing tier, we have the Kalidus Assassin. We just talked about her, so I don't need to say so much, but she just fills so many gaps in the Custodes roster and can help you do so many things we need help doing, such as secondaries and being on objectives without being shot away from that objective. In the strong tier, we have the Eversaur Assassin. He's very fast and does a lot of things decently. However, he cannot teleport around the map. So while he is fast, you do need to use your movement effectively and efficiently because he is easier to kill than the Kalidus Assassin. Because your opponent knows that at the end of their turn, the Kalidus Assassin could go away. Whereas the Eversaur Assassin will stay where he is, well, within 9 inches that is. In the flawed choice, we have the Vindicare Assassin. Again, it sounds cool being able to snipe that one character and just kill them and make your opponent cry. In reality, that rarely happens if you're playing against an opponent that is aware of how the rules work. 
and have played against a Vindicare Assassin, or at least know what the Vindicare Assassin can do. So those 80 points are probably better spent to help tune a unit or just completely add a new unit, depending on what faction you're playing. And finally, in the at least it looks cool tier, we have the Coloxus Assassin. And unfortunately, he's kind of just worse at everything that the other assassins can do, but then becomes slightly okay if it's specifically against psychic units, which, you know, again, it's, it's too niche. It's too niche for him to be actually useful. Okay, we've now talked about the assassins. We've ranked the assassins. Now I'm going to jump into Tabletop Simulator and give you a few examples of how you could use the Eversaur and Kaladus Assassin in your own Custodes army. All right, so here we are in Tabletop Simulator, and I just put up one example of how you could use your assassins. Obviously, there's a lot of things. It depends on terrain layout. It depends on matchup. It depends on mission, yada, yada, yada. This is just one example to give you an idea of how you could use your assassins. So let's pretend that this is my deployment. Obviously, there would be more units. Doesn't really matter. It's just an example for the sisters here, as well as the assassins. And let's pretend that we know that I am going first. Let's first talk about the deployment. Right, so we have one unit of Prosecutors. They're actually Witch Seekers in this scenario. Just don't worry about it. Over here, we've placed the Caladius Assassin over here. We placed the Evasaur Assassin over there. And we've placed another unit of Witch Seekers over here. So first and foremost, what if I didn't have turn one? What would happen? Well, obviously, these sisters are quite exposed and these sisters are quite exposed. So for these sisters with their pregame move, because again, let's pretend that we know I'm not going first. You do your scout moves after knowing who goes first, but before you draw your secondaries. So if I didn't go first, I would just take these girls and no move them six inches inside the wall so they were safe. For these girls over here, I could decide to either move them six inches in that direction, or I could just take them six inches behind the wall, and once again, they're safe. For my assassin, well, I mean, unless my opponent has something on the line and I know they can get behind the wall and be able to shoot me within 12 inches, I can just leave them here, but let's say they can do that. Well, in that case, I could just scout, inch, uh, scout move them 9 inches over here behind the wall. And the assassin over here, you know, even if I'm not going first, this is a fine place for her to be. Very unlikely to be targeted by anything turn 1. And at the end of my opponent's turn, I can just pick her up and reposition her as I need. Alright, so that's the scenario if I'm not going first. If I am going first, what am I doing? Well, I've placed my units with some secondaries in mind. I'm thinking, okay, what if I draw, extend battle lines, secure no man's land, deploy teleport homer, or cleanse? How can I score those objectives? Oh, and investigate signals. How can I score any of those five secondaries? Turn one. Now, if I had all my units, I would also think about, you know, area denial and, and other things. But in general, those are some of the secondaries that you don't like drawing turn one if you're not prepared for them, at least when you're playing custodies. So, how did I prepare for those secondaries? Well, let's pretend I drew Cleanse. Well, actually, sorry. First and foremost, we need to do our scout moves because we do that before we draw secondaries. So, the way I've placed these girls is that they will be able to get within this objective as well as this objective with their scout move and a normal move. So, the way I would do it is I would go 6 inches, just say there, and then 6 inches here, 6 inches there, and 6 inches there. That's my scout move with these sisters. The Evasaur would go 9 inches, there, and then the Sisters of Silence, or the, again, uh, Witch Seekers down here, once again, 6 inches, boom, boom. Uh, we don't need to be exact, but the point being that we move 6 inches, right? We move 6 inches, boom, boom, boom. Alright, alright, so now I've done my scout moves, now I draw my cards. Let's pretend I draw Cleanse, as well as Investigate Signals. Alright, Investigate Signals, that one means I have to be inside of the corners within 9 inches. Now. We know I've just scout moved my assassin from this corner, 9 inches forward. And we can see, again here, because on Tabletop Simulator you have those helpings. But if you are playing in real life, you know you put them at the board edge, and you move them 9 inches. So we know that by just going a little bit backwards, like this for example, we would now be able to get engage, or not engage on all fronts, sorry, investigate signals. For the assassin down here, we placed her within 7 inches of the objective over here, so if we didn't draw investigate signals, we could just go on the objective over here, and then these sisters could just go over to a new objective. But yeah, let's pretend investigate signals and cleanse. Alright, well, I've pre or scout moved these girls so they would be within of this objective, so I would take the sisters and go over there. The sisters over here have the choice of either going to the middle objective or the objective over here. 
Let's just say that for whatever reason, I think this is the better choice. The scissors would go here. And I would then cleanse on this objective, cleanse on that objective, investigate signals here, and investigate signals there. So there would be four points on investigate signals and five points on cleanse. Now, you might be wondering why I'm not using the assassins to cleanse. And that is simply a risk versus reward kind of situation. If I put an assassin here to do cleanse, there's a much bigger chance of my opponent being able to get within 12 inches and be able to shoot them or charge them. If my opponent shoots and or charge my Witch Seekers, I'm okay with that. That's kind of their purpose. They go out, they score some points, and then they likely die. If my opponent, say, charges these sisters, there's also a pretty good chance that I have, say, a Custodius unit over here behind the wall ready to counter charge. Over here, it might be the same. They charge the sister on the objective over there. Well, I probably have a Custodius unit over here or maybe behind the containers over there that is ready to counter charge. So my opponent is throwing something into my sisters and most likely killing them. But chances are, I then get a free charge with my Custodes onto that one unit and kill those guys. With my Assassins, while they could totally fill the same role, they are more valuable because they are harder to kill because of Lone Operative, and therefore, they're easier to use for secondary actions or holding primary. Now, in this case, where I only deployed these four units, obviously, I wouldn't be holding this objective for primary points at the start of my next turn, but again, let's pretend we're actually playing with a full army. You know, maybe I just have my Kalidus tank sitting right, right there. Because chances are, if I'm going first, my tank doesn't have any line of sight anyway. So I just place it here, or maybe it's here. So I have something on the home objective. So don't worry too much about that. All right, another scenario. Let's pretend I drew deploy teleport homers and secure no man's land. Well, these sisters over here, instead of going to the objective there, they would obviously just go to the objective over there. And they would then be able to deploy teleport homer hold this objective, secure no man's land, and then I might have to throw away this assassin over here, or again, I could just hold this no man's land objective over here. So turn one, going first, I have the option of being on all three objectives. I have the option of being in two corners, the option of being within six inches for deploy teleport homer, and obviously extend battle lines, yada, yada, yada. The only thing I didn't cover with this type of deployment would be area denial because you need to be wholly within six. That would be possible if, say, I had a Warden Squad behind this wall and I advanced them forward and they were wholly within six over here. I'm not saying that should be the play, but that would be an option. Alternatively, the Assassin over here, I could also just, you know, deploy him here and then sacrifice him for the play over there. But then I don't have something to cover the corner over here. I also don't have two units to be able to get to this objective. If these girls need to go in the middle, then this guy needs to go over there. I know that was a lot of examples all at the same time, but... What I was just trying to demonstrate with this deployment and these four units, two Witch Seekers and two Assassins, I would be able to complete a lot of the bad secondaries when it comes to Custodes. Cleansing, not something you really want to do with a Custodes unit, but doing it with an Assassin or a Witch Seeker squad, completely fine. Investigate signals, we don't really want to advance our Custodes units down to the corners because if they're, they're in, down in the corners, they're going to take a long ass time to get anywhere else on the map. However, for the assassins, that's completely fine. This assassin can be picked up at the end of my opponent's turn, so I can just, you know, I do my action, my opponent takes his turn, I remove her, and now she's ready to go wherever I need her. This guy over here can, potentially, advance, charge and shoot, and because he can advance and shoot, he's still able to do actions. So while he's outside of 9 of the objective right now, if I had placed him, say, like, just on the line for um, investigate signals, maybe I'm still outside of 9, but I just roll a 1 on the advance, I move 10 inches, I'm still able to shoot and charge because that's the ability I picked. And now I have a unit that can do an action on this objective. So yeah, this package right here of the Kalidus Assassin, the Eversaur Assassin, and then either one or two Witch Seeker units, depending on what you like. I've started to like two Witch Seeker units a lot. You can, turn one, do a lot of secondaries. Of course, there is a chance you don't get turn one and you don't get this free movement. But that's how it goes every game, right? These sisters will still be able to do some secondaries and then die. These assassins will still be able to chill in the corner or behind the wall outside of 12, not being able to be shot or charged at. And then later in the game, the Caldus assassin is the one that's most likely to stay alive. She's the one I play the most defensively with, because having that plus one command point increase on a battle stratagem is very powerful. Here's a fun fact you didn't know. In theory, turn one, you can take the Caldus assassin and put her in deep strike. She has to come down by turn three. However, because the rules in 10th edition allow it, you can use your abilities while you are in Deep Strike. So if you're really scared of this assassin dying, let's say you're playing against Gene Stealer Colts and you just don't have any way of protecting her, 
you could, in theory, just leave her in reserves, and then the first time your opponent uses their battle stratagem, she can still use that plus one command point increase. The Eversaw Assassin, let's say he does investigate signals here, the opponent moves some chaffs over on the objective. I could commit a Custodius unit to 100% clear this chaff unit, but depending on what it is, the Assassin might be perfectly capable of doing it because sustain hits free, and then a lot of attacks. That might be enough to clear the objective of those units. Now my Assassin is obviously in a spot where he can get killed, but he scored me investigate signals, he killed an opponent's chaff, and he's threatening to score primary points if my opponent doesn't deal with him. He does all of those three rolls for 75 points, which is just not possible for any other unit in the Custodes army. For this girl over here, let's say I've used her ability. In theory, I can just leave her behind this wall on the objective, or just like in the middle of the objective, or even just over here at the very edge of the objective, right there. She's now screening a little bit. You know, she can't screen perfectly, but she's screening a little bit. She has a flamer, she has fight first. If my opponent does not commit a proper unit that can like tank her flamer and tank her melee attacks or guarantee to kill her in shooting, then she can happily just hold my primary objective for the rest of the game. If my opponent then needs to commit something, you know, fairly strong to go kill her, well, I now know that they deployed something down here in my deployment zone and I can start pushing up with my custodius unit towards their home objective, for example. Again, it's a little hard to give very specific advice with the assassins because it depends on matchup, terrain, mission, blah blah blah. But I hope this gave you some insight on how useful the assassins can be in the Custodes army and in general in a lot of armies. Oh, and if you for some reason are playing fixed in Custodes, which I don't think you should like 9 out of 10 times, maybe against Chaos Knights and Imperial Knights, that's fine. But if that was your thing, this marker here shows 6 inches within uh, the middle for deploy teleport homers. So for example, turn one, these girls could do teleport homer, then they die. Let's just say they're dead. They're dead. Then the Evasaur Assassin could do te te deploy teleport homers, and then, you know, maybe he dies. And then finally, the Caldas Assassin could do deploy teleport homers. And then she probably dies. But that's nine points on deploy teleport homers. The better way of doing it would probably be deploy teleport homers with the Witch Seekers and the Evasaur Assassin, but then use the Caldas Assassin to do, say, deploy teleport homers, I don't know, down here. Maybe she still dies, but she gets you 4 points instead of 3 points. She's also in a spot where your opponent now needs to deal with her. Then you could have, I don't know, your wardens on the objective here, and if your opponent is committing too much down here, well then they start moving forward, or just deploys teleport homers here, etc, etc. Case and point. Assassins are really good for custodies, they help a ton. That's the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. If you feel like it, join the Discord, and until I see you again, I hope you have a wonderful time.